So we will now um, jump to the early periods of, uh, of nonviolent resistance. Um, and we will start our session with a paper by Anathea Portier Young from Duke University, Jewish Apocalyptic Literature as Resistant Literature. Well, in popular imagination, apocalypse has come to mean end times. Popular religious approaches to biblical apocalypses, and especially among evangelical Christians, frequently focus on calculating and preparing for the end times, pinpointing when they will happen, uh, what will be the signs. In other popular media, apocalypse takes new form in cataclysmic disaster, threatening human life and the state of the planet. Now, modern fascination with the end of the world as we know it occupies a site where multiple vectors converge. The recognition of powers beyond our own, the recognition that human power structures, how we interact with the natural world, how we interact with one another, that these are not sustainable. And in the face of these recognitions, we could name the vectors of fear, desire, resistance, and hope. Fear of destruction, disease, loss of life and freedom, desire for a better world, for justice and prosperity, resistance to powers of oppression, to seemingly inevitable forces of destruction, hope for redemption, life beyond death and destruction and salvation. Now, how we came to associate these fears and hopes with apocalypse owes in part to the remarkable creativity of ancient authors who transmitted their own sometimes cataclysmic visions within a literary form or genre that first emerged in the third century BCE and became increasingly popular within both Judaism and Christianity in the centuries that followed. Now for a time, the book of Daniel composed around 165 BCE was believed to be the earliest ancient Jewish apocalypse. Manuscripts discovered in the 20th century enabled scholars to recognize that Daniel was not the first apocalypse, nor was it as bizarre, unusual, or marginal as it had previously appeared. We will, however, see that it is distinctive in a way that's very important for this conference in its advancing of a program of nonviolent resistance, but we're going to contextualize that uh, within the broader landscape of the ancient apocalypses. So Daniel was found instead to be one exemplar of a genre that first took shape in Judea in the Hellenistic period, likely beginning in the third century BCE. So slide four uh, shows the major ancient apocalypses from the period of the genre's first emergence to the first century CE. Slide five, the genre arose in response to a cultural and political moment characterized by extreme violence and rapacity on the part of the generals who succeeded Alexander the Great and battled each other for control of various portions of his vast empire. And this was an era marked by continuous warfare and military occupation. In that period, conquest created empire, ongoing military activity, occupation, taxation, tribute, and colonial power maintained it. Judea and surrounding territories were prized and contested spoils of war. Slide six groups these major ancient apocalypses in relation to a series of catalyzing events and circumstances. Now, the earliest apocalypses did not merely take shape within this landscape of imperial violence. They resisted it. Their writers were not, as previously imagined, hiding behind anonymity, nor did they detach from reality. The early apocalyptic visionaries hailed from the centers of power rather than the margins. They urged public preaching, teaching, and witness. They aimed to convert a wide audience to a message of hope. They sought to transform and heal imaginations that had been colonized and traumatized in empire's wake. And they did not seek to escape painful and devastating realities, but engaged them head on. And to understand how apocalypses resisted empire, we'll first want to have a shared understanding of what an apocalypse is. Uh, on the next slide, 
1979, a group of scholars in the Society of Biblical Literature Genres Project articulated a definition of apocalypse as a literary genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality that is both temporal insofar as it envisions uh, eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Slide eight, the scholars in the SBL genres project identified two major subgenres within that overarching genre description. They were the cosmic or heavenly journey apocalypse and the historical apocalypse. As we consider ways that the early apocalypse has resisted empire, we must recognize ways that empires claimed to order the world. They exercised their power through force, but also through propaganda and ideology. Empire manipulated and co-opted hegemonic social institutions to express and reinforce its values and cosmology. So resisting imperial domination in that context required challenging not only the physical means of coercion, but also empire's claims about knowledge, its claims about the world. Both types of apocalypses, the the cosmic or heavenly journey and the historical apocalypse disrupted and disempowered imperial apparatuses of social control, each in distinctive ways. They empowered resistant action through visions of alternative futures. Now, a caution. Not all apocalypses sought to resist empire. The earliest extant apocalypses were works of resistance, yet the apocalypses did not always generate attitudes of resistance, and there's no necessary correlation between apocalyptic literature and resistance literature. The history of effects reveals that apocalyptic texts originally written and received as works of resistance have frequently been reinterpreted to support the status quo, to reinforce rather than challenge structures of domination. There's nothing inherent in the genre that requires an apocalypse to challenge injustice, to free its readers from the chains of false consciousness or incite political reform. The epistemological certainties and claims to heavenly authority that typically undergird apocalyptic writings can also support agendas both radical and reactionary. Moreover, some literature we classify as apocalyptic does not appear to have ever functioned as resistance literature in any obvious sense. Some ancient apocalyptic writers uh, were resigned to imperial rule after the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in 70 CE and the final defeat of the Judeans by the Romans in 135 CE. Jewish apocalyptic writers focused on messages of mourning, consolation, and comfort, and they increasingly looked forward to judgment after death rather than intervention in this world. For Ezra and Tubaruk are examples in this vein. And later we find Apocalypse is written to bolster the power of kings and empires. In the modern period, we've increasingly seen Apocalypse commodified and used to support diverse political agendas. On the next slide, uh, we'll say a few words about resistance. Resistance frequently conjures images of armed rebellion or organized protest. In her seminal work on resistance literature, Barbara Harlow, locate such literature within an organized collective movement that engages in two struggles simultaneously, one for political liberation and social transformation, and the other struggle over the historical and cultural record. Yet resistance is a wider phenomenon even than this. Political scientist James C. Scott studies forms of everyday resistance that allow practitioners to gain or maintain privileges, goods, rights and freedoms in a system of domination in which they have little ascribed power. In the book of Exodus, for example, we might think of the resistance of the Hebrew midwives or Moses' mother and sister as examples of everyday resistance that precede and set the stage for the later Exodus from Egypt. On the next slide, resistance in any form cannot be understood apart from power. J.M. Barbelay emphasizes the structural relationship between power and resistance in his definition of resistance 
as those factors which in limiting the exercise of power contribute to the outcome of the power relationship. He understands power in terms articulated by Max Weber as, quote, the probability that one actor will be in a position to carry out his own will despite resistance, regardless of the basis on which this probability rests. We'll go to the next slide. Power alone does not provide an adequate frame for understanding the objects and aims of resistance and resistance literature, particularly with regard to these ancient apocalypses. Resistance emerges within and responds to domination and hegemony. Domination can refer to directly political, economic, or physically coercive forms of social control. Examples include conquest and plunder, slavery, torture, military occupation, as well as exploitative economic practices. Hegemony refers to social and ideological structures that create and maintain conditions of subordination and to the strategies and actions that aim to establish, maintain, or augment these structures. These more subtle means of controlling thought and behavior include indoctrination through education and propaganda, ritual, systems of patronage, and other structured practices of everyday life. On the next slide, we might think about the ways that state media function in totalitarian regimes. Today, propaganda is distributed through radio, TV, flyers, education. In the ancient world, regimes lacked access, of course, to electronic media, but still projected their propaganda through monumental art, coinage, slogans, education, and more. Such propaganda projects what we call a totalizing discourse, a narrative about the world that says that's all there is. The power is absolute. But if totalitarian state media have the power to constrain, other media have the power to free the imagination, giving the lie to these totalizing claims and asserting that different realities, different futures are possible. Literature that aims to limit, oppose, or reject hegemonic institutions and cosmologies and systems, strategies and acts of domination can be called resistance literature. Next slide. The earliest examples of the genre apocalypse were preserved in a collection known as One Enoch, the Enochic Book of Watchers, likely composed in the third century BCE, resisted imperial violence through discourse, refracting politically charged Hellenistic myths such as the Gigantomachy battle between giants through native traditions and employing a strategy of symbolic inversion to critique the warring rulers, generals, and armies of the Hellenistic empires. Its narrative of Enoch's heavenly journey, moreover, countered imperial practices of map making, imperial ideology of dominance with alternative geography and alternative cosmology. Next slide. A period of intense religio-political crisis in the early second century BCE gave rise to a further development. The apocalypse is composed in this period, namely the Enochic Apocalypse of Weeks and Book of Dreams and the Book of Daniel, continued to resist imperial violence through critical discourse. But that discourse also articulated models, visions, and programs of resistant action. The Greek word apokalypsis refers to uncovering what is hidden, using the image of removing a veil bringing knowledge from darkness into light or unsealing a scroll that was written long ago. Next slide. Thus a key feature of apocalypses and apocalyptic literature more broadly is that they aim to reveal what is hidden. That hidden knowledge might be an alternative interpretation of the past or a view of present realities that lies beyond ordinary powers of perception. It asserts a heavenly reality normally hidden from view that powerfully shapes events on earth. It asserts that appearances on earth are deceptive and removes this purported mask to reveal the hidden and frequently monstrous character of earth's powers. It also aims to reveal the hidden activity of God and God's holy ones on earth. Next slide. 
The historical apocalypse is also purported to reveal knowledge about the future, both the course of events God had ordained and the choices and future that God would open up for God's people and for the world. This knowledge was not meant to induce a stance of passive waiting, but rather was meant to shape human action and clarify choices in the present and future. Next slide. These earliest historical apocalypses and the programs of resistant action they envisioned emerged in the context of the policies and actions of the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. In 167 BCE, Antiochus IV reconquered Judea and launched a campaign of state terror and religious persecution within Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside. On the next slide, we see the book of Daniel urged a program of nonviolent resistance that emboldened, terrorized, and persecuted Judeans to hold fast to their covenant obligations, to stand firm in the specific practices of their faith, and teach others to do the same, and even to die as martyrs in the face of persecution. And on this slide, you see some of the key points that this book makes, uh, uses the language to be strong and take action, but that action is defined as teaching, it's defined as leading others to righteousness, uh, a willingness to experience martyrdom in order to achieve atonement for the people. Uh, and the narrative also provides the example of the characters Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael who engage in activities such as prayer, fasting, and study. Uh, it, who emphasize keeping covenant at the risk of their own lives and who engage in truth telling, public testimony, speaking truth to power in the face of threat against their own lives. On the next slide, uh, we can see that like Daniel, the apocalypse of weeks envisioned resistance through witnessing. Unlike Daniel, however, the apocalypse of weeks also envisioned direct action that would result in radical social transformation. In this book, the righteous would uproot structures of violence and deceit and at an appointed time would be given a sword to enact justice against the wicked. So this is an example of a contrast among these ancient apocalypses where we see the book of Daniel, for example, advancing a program of nonviolent direct action uh, and a book like The Apocalypse of Weeks, advancing a program that included violent action. On the next slide, we see another example of the latter. The Book of Dreams modeled a twofold program of resistance, one through the transmission of revelatory traditions and practices of prophetic preaching, much like the Book of Daniel, uh, practices also of lament, intercessory prayer, and praise. The other however, through armed revolt against invading and occupying military forces. And their military action was understood synergistically, meaning in response to their cry for divine aid, God would intervene to ensure victory. Next slide, please. The apocalypses did not only resist through critique and through programs of action. Understanding earthly circumstances in terms of a revealed transcendent reality, a new world view, also provided consolation for those who would otherwise despair of hope. The Apocalypse of Weeks, Daniel, and the Book of Dreams resisted an attempt to unmake the world and unmake identity by offering new sight, by naming terror and hope, by insisting on the integrity of reality and denying the ultimacy of imperial power. And in its place, they asserted the totality of heavenly rule, divine creation, sacred knowledge. The combining of narrative and vision in this nascent uh, genre provided both a necessary frame and story as well as a way forward into the future. Trauma and terror could be said to have stopped time, and these historical apocalypses resisted the fragmentation of time and the fragmentation of self by means of a new literary form that unified past, present, and future, piecing time and people back together again and transforming memory and perception. Next slide, please. The function of the earliest apocalypses as resistance to imperial 
violence does not inoculate apocalyptic discourse against perpetrating or perpetuating violence of its own. While apocalypses first function to critique and resist hegemony and domination, they could also replicate and reinforce it. Apocalypses can authorize and uphold existing unjust systems. They can help to establish new ones. There is a stark moral dualism that is a frequent hallmark of the genre. And uh, this has the risk of demonizing enemies and insulating one's own affinity group from challenge or critique. Next and last slide, please. Yet there remains a potentiality within apocalyptic literature to help liberate the imagination. Through their apocalyptic writings, ancient visionaries sought to forge a shared apocalyptic imagination, a new consciousness that perceived a hidden reality on heaven and earth. By igniting this fuse of changed perception, they sought to empower their audiences to venture, to break out of the prison of the imperial imaginary, and to imagine in its place alternative structures of governance and a path to religious and political freedoms. We have surveyed ancient apocalypses with a wide range of resistant postures. Of all the ancient apocalypses, it was the one that advanced a program of active nonviolent resistance that was preserved as scripture within the Tanakh. Thank you.